Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to its episode 170, I think, is of Left Side of the Aisle, which I mentioned for absolutely no reason at all. Um, my name is Larry Erickson. I'm your host. And for the next half hour, I'm going to be rattling away about things that I think are important enough for you to take note of. Uh, if you have any comments or reactions to the show, email me. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. Uh, as always, if you do email me, please uh, include something in the subject line to make clear this is not spam. And uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm kind of slow about dealing with my email. All right, with that out of the way, let's get right to it. Got a lot to cover this week. First off, as I always like to start when I can with some good news, we've got some. In a two-to-one ruling, and this is actually uh, last week, but uh, since uh, I was on vacation, I didn't get to talk about it then, so um, we're talk, going to talk about it now. Uh, in a two-to-one ruling, a panel, a three-judge panel of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals has upheld a lower court decision uh, striking down Virginia's ban on same-sex marriage as unconstitutional. Uh, they found the state, quoting, has failed to advance a compelling state interest justifying its definition of marriage as between only a man and a woman. Writing for the majority in the case, Judge Henry Floyd said that personal opposition to same-sex marriage is not a legitimate legal basis for denying it. Inertia and apprehension, he wrote, I love that line, inertia and apprehension are not legitimate bases for denying same-sex couples due process and equal protection of the laws. The choice of whether and whom to marry is an intensely personal decision that alters the course of one's life. Denying same-sex couples this choice prohibits them from participating fully in our society. And to make the news even better, on Wednesday, the uh, 13th, the, uh, this court refused to stay the uh, impact of the ruling, which the result that um, same-sex marriages could begin in Virginia as soon as next week. The Fourth Circuit, by the way, includes three other states that have bans on same-sex marriage, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and West Virginia. And in one of those, in response to that decision, uh, the Attorney General of the state of North Carolina said that his state would no longer defend that state's ban on same-sex marriage in court on the grounds that uh, North Carolina's law, being very similar to Virginia's law, would, quote, almost certainly, unquote, be struck down by the circuit court. However, on the other hand of this, we have not good news. Um, now, after, after the U.S. v. Windsor, now th this was the 2013 Supreme Court decision that struck down parts of the Defense of Marriage Act. After that, advocates of same-sex marriage have seen a string of more than two dozen victories in state and federal court. But um, now we've lost one. It came in a state court in Tennessee where Judge Russell Simmons upheld Tennessee's ban on recognizing same-sex marriages that were performed legally in other states where it's allowed. He insisted that, quote, neither the federal government nor any other state should be allowed to dictate to Tennessee what has traditionally been a state's responsibility which has been the argument gen uh, generally adopted by the minorities in these court decisions, although I'm still unclear on exactly what basis they say a state's authority overrides that of the federal constitution. Still, even in light of this, legal analysts say a single state court decision is unlikely to affect the federal court decisions where that unbroken string continues so far. Uh, all along through this entire process, advocates of marriage equality, well, we've been bracing ourselves for uh, an inevitable loss. I mean, it had to come sooner or later. We had to lose one. And it looks like sooner or later may be getting here. Based on people's reactions to the oral arguments that were presented, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers four states, Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky, may be ready to break that string. Uh, two of the three judge panel seem to be skeptical about the idea that a ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. One of them even declared that, quoting, I'd have thought the best way to get respect and dignity is through the democratic process. 
which to me echoes the anti-constitutional and bluntly un-American attitude that uh, that's always used to oppose civil rights suits, which is that you really don't have rights. What you have is the approval of the majority. But still, even a loss in the Sixth Circuit could prove to be a benefit in the longer term because creating a division in how circuit courts uh, rule on this would, uh, would likely speed up the uh, schedule by which the Supreme Court will take up the issue in order to resolve the conflict. And that's, where, of course, where it gets tricky. There are four solid reactionary votes against marriage equality on that bench. There are four reliable votes uh, in support of it. And there is Anthony Kennedy. He authored the Windsor decision, again, the one that struck down parts of the uh, Defense of Marriage Act. And in that decision, he seemed to like only reluctantly come to the conclusion that the rights of same-sex couples had to um, override the idea of a traditional state role in defining marriage. Um, and the question is, faced not with the issue of federal government benefits to same-sex couples, which was the issue in Windsor, but the actual issue of same-sex marriage itself, would he just want to punt on the issue and just say basically it's up to the states? On the other hand, during his time on the Supreme Court, there have been three landmark civil rights cases which helped advance LGBT rights. There was Romer v. Evans in 1996, which struck down a Colorado state constitutional amendment that banned laws protecting gays and lesbians. There was Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, which struck down laws making that in effect made gay sex a crime. And of course, the Windsor decision. Kennedy authored all three. As MSNBC, uh, MSNBC reporter Adam Surter asked, uh, in one sense, this seems to be his life's work. What are the chances that when he has the opportunity, he won't want to finish it? So there's still a chance of that. All right, ne next up, a hero award, which we give around here occasionally to people who just do the right thing on a matter big or small. This time, the Hero Award goes to a whole bunch of Peter, uh, people, rather, commuters in Perth, Australia. One of my lasting memories of the first time I vis visited the United Kingdom was riding on the underground and at every stop hearing the recorded warning, Mind the Gap. Uh, it was a warning of the fact that there was a small gap between the car and the platform and telling people to be careful about that. Well, last week, a man in Perth, Australia, uh, discovered the importance of that warning. He was boarding a subway train near the end of the morning rush hour, and as he stood by the door, his foot slipped, and his leg got trapped between the car and the platform. A passenger who was going to get on behind him immediately notified uh, station personnel, who notified the driver to make sure the train didn't move and perhaps take this guy's leg off. All right, so what happened then? Scores of passengers, together with the staff at the station, got together and managed to tilt the subway car enough for the guy to get his leg free. Pure people power. And not only that, the other thing that got me about this was that when they got the guy out, there were a couple of people applauding, there, there were several grins, but nobody was going around puffing their chest and high-fiving everybody in sight. It was like the attitude was, oh, look, this guy's stuck. Okay, let's get him out. Okay, we did that. Cool, he's fine. Okay, let's get on with our day. Um, they just didn't make a big use thing about it. They got the guy out and they went about their business. Which is the second reason, as far as I'm concerned, why you morning commuters at Stirling Underground Station in Perth, Australia, you're heroes. All right, from the sublime to the ridiculous, we go to the Clown Award, one of our regular weekly features given, as always, for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the winner of the Big Red Nose is the Coca-Cola Company. Now, to understand this, you need a little background. There's real controversy over the choice of the nation of Qatar to host the 2022 World Cup, which has been described quite reasonably as the world's largest sporting event. Because even if you go beyond the allegations of bribery and corruption in the selection process, there are the facts surrounding the medieval conditions in which the migrant workers who are building the stadiums are being forced to live. 
For one thing, they're being paid about $10 a day, maybe, if they get paid. Some of them haven't been paid in more than a year. They're squeezed seven to a room. They sleep on thin, dirty mattresses or on bunk beds, all this in violation of Qatar's own labor standards. They live in constant fear of arrest and imprisonment because they have no paperwork. They are undocumented workers because the contractor on the project, Lee Trading and Contracting, collapsed, so all the paperwork's gone. As a result, some of these workers are being exploited to the point where they're being paid as little as about 85 cents an hour. What's more, the work is dangerous enough and the, the risk's high enough, the condition's bad enough that it has been estimated that about 4,000 of these workers will die before a single ball is kicked. And the workers can't even leave. They can't even just give it up and go home because even if they somehow had enough money to afford the trip, legally they cannot leave Qatar without the permission of their employer and the government. Okay, enter Coca-Cola which is one of, the, uh, one of the major international corporate sponsors of the World Cup. Now Coca-Cola notes that for these workers, a phone call home can cost as much as 91 cents a minute. That's more than an hour's wage. They also say that the average income for these workers is about $6 a day. So the company put together this supposedly feel-good commercial called Hello Happiness featuring workers using a Coke-designed phone booth where one Coke bottle cap pays for a three-minute international phone call. The tagline to the commercial is, happiness is a Coca-Cola and a phone call home. There is, of course, in this ad no mention of how much you have to pay to get the bottle of Coke to get the cap or of how much more soda the company expects to sell as a result of this. But beyond that, Set against a background uh, of corruption, bribery, exploitation, death, and what amounts to modern slavery, the executives and ad managers of the Coca-Cola Corporation have decided that all people really need is a bottle of Coke and a phone call and everything uh, is absolutely just fine. An attitude which is either inhumanely callous or and you actually have to hope this is the real cause because uh, it's actually the preferable alternative. It's an example of missing the point on a truly galactic scale. In either event, the Coca-Cola Corporation, you're a clown. All right, one uh, going on now. We have a brief story about guns, which isn't really about guns. Earlier this month, residents of Aurora, Colorado, which is the scene of 2012's deadly rampage by James Holmes, called 911 because they were concerned about a young man who was walking around with a shotgun. Police approached the man. He turned out to be 18-year-old Steve Lohner. When asked why he's carrying a shotgun, he says, it's for the defense of myself and those around me. He says he's 18, the minimum age to legally possess a weapon in Colorado, but when asked to produce ID to prove his age, he refuses. He argues with the cops, insisting he doesn't have to because he hasn't done anything wrong. He also refuses to hand over the gun, which, by the way, was loaded. The end result of this was that Loner, who says he's on a mission to make people comfortable with guns, is cited on a misdemeanor obstruction charge for refusing to show his ID. Okay, several days later, a shopper in a Walmart in Beaver Creek, Ohio, called 911 to report a man in the store with a gun. The police approached 22-year-old John Crawford in an aisle in the toy section. He was holding a gun, a toy one. Uh, police claim it was a BB rifle. They demanded he drop the weapon. He responded by saying, it's not real, and they shot him to death. Okay. In both cases, you have someone calling 911 about a young man with a gun. The similarities end there. In the first, you had someone with a loaded shotgun. In the second, you had someone with an unloaded BB gun. In the first, you had someone who argued with the cops, refused to show ID, refused to yield up the weapon. In the second, you had someone who had no chance to argue, was never asked for ID, and was given perhaps a couple of seconds to drop the gun or else. In the first, you had someone who walked away with what amounted to little more than a traffic ticket. 
and still holding the gun, and the second, you had a man bleeding to death on the floor. And there was one other difference. This is Steve Lohner. This is John Crawford. And if you're in any way surprised by that difference, you shouldn't be. We're taking a break. All right, and we're back. A um, couple more quick things about, about guns, a couple more quick notes about guns. Uh, one is that there's a bit of good news on the gun front. On Tuesday, August 12th, U.S. District Judge Catherine Blake ruled that Maryland's gun control law is constitutional. The law is called the Firearm Safety Act of 2013, and it was passed in reaction to the massacre of children at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut in December of 2012. It's one of the strictest such laws in the country. It bans 45 types of assault weapons and limits gun magazines to no more than 10 rounds each. The law makes it illegal to manufacture, possess, sell, offer to sell, transfer, purchase, or receive any type of assault firearm. Punishment for breaking the law can be three years in jail and a $5,000 fine. Now, the gun nuts, of course, argued that this was a terrible, horrible, awful intrusion on their sacred Second Amendment rights. But the state successfully countered that the law focused on the kinds of firearms that are used in mass shootings and so actually serve to protect the public. Um, so there's some good news there. And in fact, that kind of good news may be less surprising than we seem to think. Uh, it seems sometimes we hear a near constant drumbeat of, of this restriction being, you'll pardon the expression, shot down, or that one being overturned, or that the nutsoid rabbit brains of America, the, the NRA, getting this or gaining that. Um, that may be more rhetoric than actual reality. First, recall that the case, the District of Columbia v. Heller, this is the 2008 Supreme Court decision that for the first time in U.S. history found that the Second Amendment included an individual right to own a gun. Uh, well, remember that first, that's the case that did this. Well, in, his, in a new book called The Second Amendment, a Biography, uh, many Michael Waldman, he is the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law, uh, in that book, he argues that even since Heller, courts have actually upheld most gun laws. Uh, the courts have found that, yes, according to the Supreme Court, individuals do have a right to possess a gun, but society has a right to protect itself as well. So, as Waldman advises, we have to keep on keeping on. We can't give up on this because the gun nuts never did. Which, by the way, indirectly raises something else. I just wanted to—I just wanted to mention, just because. Something that always strikes me funny is when the gun nuts start going on about how any legislation that puts any restrictions on their toys is violating the rights of law-abiding gun owners. But the thing is, if your state, such as Maryland did, uh, passes a gun, for example, a law rather, uh, banning some type of assault rifle, and you get one. You're not law-abiding. A change in a law, by definition, cannot violate the rights of law-abiding gun owners because the term law-abiding is based on what the law is. It is not some aspect of your personality, I'm law-abiding, but it's, it's what the law is and whether or not you follow it. So please, I don't want to hear any more about about gun owners proclaiming how they are law-abiding because frankly that's the very least we could expect of you. And one last thing on this, and this is really just as an observation. Uh, Representative Thomas Marino of Pennsylvania has received an A rating from the NRA in the past. Well a few weeks ago one of his staffers, men named Ryan Sukard, was arrested for trying to carry a pistol into the Cannon House office building, which is one of the buildings where they have the, uh, the offices for members of the House of Representatives. The thing is, the NRA flunkies in Congress are happy to see guns everywhere, happy to see them in stores and schools and parks, on trains and buses, love to see people packing heat everywhere they go. Something else that they are delighted to have is the fact that it is a felony to try to carry a gun to where they work. All right, from there, 
just a relatively brief RIP. Uh, not because you needed to be informed about it, because you know about it, but just because I wanted to mention it. Uh, Robin Williams has died in apparent suicide. He was 63. I'm not going to say anything about his life or his career because there's more than enough of that available all over the media and that will tell you more and in more detail than I could possibly cover. I will say that I first became aware of him as, as I think most people actually first became aware of him through the uh, sitcom Mork and Mindy. I still remember giving my wife my one sentence review of the show. The show is stupid, but he's great. Um, I also recall thinking later that Pam Dauber was actually underappreciated in her role in the show, uh, which essentially was keeping him in check and keeping the plot moving, plus managing to keep a straight face whenever he started ad-libbing. She didn't always succeed, actually, at that. Oh, and one little bit of trivia, which you may not know. Uh, his opening monologue in the movie, that several minute monologue to open Good Morning Vietnam, that was entirely ad-libbed. In fact, he did it several times until he got one he was happy with. Now, there were, of course, these stupid reactions like Rush Limburger saying Williams committed suicide because of his leftist worldview, because lefties are never happy. And one article that was supposed to be serious, it was supposed to be serious, telling people to avoid triggers for depression. Most of which, it turned out, were things like financial worries, losing someone in your life, losing a job, being under stress, and being sick. Like those situations were conscious choices that you made, which could be avoided simply by deciding to do so. Oh yes, I don't want to have the stress of, uh, of having financial woes, so I've just decided I'm going to be rich. I just decided I'm never going to be sick, so I won't get depressed. You know, one of the things, depression is easy to misunderstand. It's easy to not get a grip on because everybody gets depressed. Everybody gets blue from time to time. But that's simply not the same. Getting blue is not the same as true depression. It's not the same as clinical depression. You know the expression about being so low you have to reach up to touch bottom? You need to know that there are worse places. I think I've talked, actually, I think I've talked about this before here. There are worse places, places where there is no bottom and where you feel like you're going to sink forever. The damning thing about depression, the most damning thing about it, is that you feel like it's never going to get better. It's never going to improve. I mean, most of the time when you're sick, unless you're, unless you're terminal or been told flat out that it's incurable, when you're sick, you can, you can envision yourself getting better. The problem with depression is that when it hits you, you do not think of yourself as getting better. It's the most damning thing about it. It becomes a constant battle to keep up, to keep going. Robin Williams fought that battle for years. He fought it with booze, he fought it with drugs, he fought it with pills, he fought it with therapy, he fought it with comedy. But ultimately, it was a battle that he lost, and one which we have lost as well. So, RIP Robin Williams. All right, last for this week. Uh, there's a good deal of news coming out of Iraq, but I'm not at least this week going to talk about it, partly because it's one of those situations where whatever I say, it could be obsolete by the time you hear it. But I am going to address one narrow point, and it is the outrage of the week. On August 7th, Barack Obama authorized U.S. airstrikes on ISIS military targets. The purpose, we were told, was to support Kurdish forces trying to hold off ISIS and to, and to protect Yazidi refugees trapped in the mountains of northern Iraq, refugees that ISIS regards as devil worshippers worthy of death. There were 14 airstrikes in the first four days. Meanwhile, the amazing Mr. O has authorized the deployment of 130 additional military advisors to northern Iraq, bringing the total number of U.S. advisors in the country to over 400. Secretary of War Chuck Hagel insists this is not combat boots on the ground type of operation, but considering that these additional advisors consist of Marines and Special Operations Forces, I'm not sure that the difference between combat and advisor is not more semantic than real. The bottom line here is that as columnist Doyle McManus at the LA Times wrote, quoting him, even without American boots on the ground, Obama has entered the United States into its fourth Iraq war. It won't be over quickly. 
as the president said, this is going to be a long-term project. And boots on the ground, in fact, may be in the offing. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that the military is weighing a decision to uh, take on a military mission in Iraq to rescue the thousands of Yazidi refugees, a move that would risk putting American forces in direct military confrontation with ISIS forces. Now, the paper says the proposal is still under development and has not been approved by Obama, adding that the military calls it just one of many options, which still means it's an option. Okay, that's the news, or at least that part of it that involves American military forces. Here's the issue. In all of that, and all the coverage that you've seen, and all the discussions of sorties and plans being weighed, and no combat troops press releases, and all the discussions and, and analysis, in all of that, did you see anywhere any discussion, any word about what is the authority to do this? Where is Obama's authority to just start dropping bombs in Iraq? Where is his authority to undertake military missions? What would be his authority to send ground troops into Iraq for any reason, humanitarian or otherwise? Where is his authority to get us into our fourth Iraq war? Now note, this has nothing to do with whether or not you think what he's doing is a good idea or not. It has nothing to do with whether or not you think a mission to rescue the, the Yazidis would be a good idea or not. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with his implicit claims of constitutional authority to send the U.S. military anywhere he wants, anytime he wants, on any mission he wants, seemingly in any numbers he wants, without needing any approval of any sort from Congress. And not only is he claiming that power, we have a Congress and a media that are apparently content to sit back and let him have it. And I find that a frightening concept, and quite bluntly, I think you should too. So I have to ask yet again, one more time, Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? Because what you're doing is an outrage. Okay, that's it for this week. We're going to wrap up there. We will see you back next week with more news, hopefully some better news. Uh, but for the moment, I'm just going to say you just have the best week you possibly can. And peace.